Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Today we have our Jono Dor. Uh, I assume that everyone knows Jono here. He did his uh, undergrad here, he did his PhD here. Now that Alice arrived, so we really can start. <laughs> uh, I think that he won almost every prize in every conference that he went as a student. So if you're a PhD student, you're very lucky that uh, he finished, because now you have the chance to win by yourself. Uh, he also had uh, a very large experience with uh, CAG here and in Germany, and after that with Santa Clara in Australia. And now he's he heading a team in a, a solo on Lithic, and that will be the topic of uh, his talk. So please welcome Jono. Thanks very much, Ziv. Um, I would point out that the prizes I didn't win during my PhD were all the ones that Ziv did win, so uh, I'm very honoured to be introduced by such a man. Um, and I'm very honoured, of course, to, to be here f in front of you all to talk today about uh, solar analytics. Um, it's a bit different compared to what I spoke about last time I was here a couple of years ago, um, but it's a, a very exciting company and something I'm really um, proud to be involved in. So. Let's go through. Oh, there we go. I'm, I'm uh, fearing a, a font compatibility, compatibility issue, but we'll see how we go. Hopefully, they're all okay. So um, what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'll go through a few things. Start with about Solar Analytics itself. Um, I'll go through some typical faults and case studies um, that we've experienced in the field. And I'll talk about a few of the research projects that we're embarking on. Um, many that uh, involve UNSW, in fact, so, so that's why it's extra special to be here. All right, so to begin with, about solar analytics. Um, bear with me, this will be a, a little bit of the marketing spiel as well, so I'll try to uh, get through this bit uh, reasonably quickly, but I think it is important to understand what we do and why we do it. So our purpose is to maximise the value customers receive from their solar energy system. Um, so basically it's, it's understanding that it's not enough just to whack a solar system on a house and go away and everything's going to be all right. That system's going to be there for at least 20 years by warranty, but likely more. And we're about trying to make sure that the customer gets that maximum value by understanding what's happening with that solar system. Um, a couple of things in an overview. Um, I don't need to convince you guys of this, <laughs> but coal is not good for humanity. Um, apart from the obvious environmental aspects, it's just plain expensive. Um, we've seen enough seminars now to understand that um, new coal is much more expensive than new renewable energy. And uh, so I don't think it will be too long before we see an end to this kind of um, um, eyesore on our trips around the country. So solar energy, that's what we're all about. It's a saviour. So we've seen data from APVI showing the increase in solar installations over the last few years. And of course, I think you're all familiar with this slide as well, suggesting that um, towards the end of the century, we're really going to see solar be a major, um, in fact, the dominant contributor to energy production throughout the world. And it's already happening here and now in our homes. So if we look at a a suburb, suburb here, I think this one's in, uh, in southeast Queensland. And then I'm not going to suggest your eyes are all good enough to see exactly what's inside those little marks, but I suggest you might be able to guess. Anyone tell me what those little red uh, things mean? Swimming pools. <laughs> <laughs> they may be swimming pools, and if those people are smart, they will be powering their swimming pool pumps by solar panels. Indeed, they are solar um, arrays that are on all those, all those houses. So it is getting more and more prevalent around our suburbs and we'll see that continue over the coming years. Okay, but there is a problem here. There's a nice solar array on top of our roof, but if we were to look a little closer at a few of them, we might see a few issues. So soiling, dust, etc. Shading, okay, we all like trees, but we don't like trees shading our nice little solar panels and preventing the photons from getting through. Um, panel failures. So they don't happen that often, but they do happen and you don't want it to happen to your system. Inverter failures. 
can we play a little game here? I'm not going to tell you what brand of inverter this is, but let me just, uh, let me just tell you that it's probably one of the worst performers out there as far as, far as faults go. Um, can someone guess for me what the um, failure rate of this inverter was per installation? Oh, so far over their entire experience. Come on, have a guess, someone. Five percent. Five percent. Higher. Hundred percent. Higher. <laughs> I'm serious. One hundred and forty percent per installation. So, so many failed that some have been installed twice, and both of them have failed. More. So, although the panels we think are all fine, there's other issues around the uh, the installations. And of course, you know what that means. So there is a solution to this. And if we look at um, the solar monitoring industry, which we're a part of, this is growing and growing every year. So we've got 19% growth per year in the solar monitoring industry. But unfortunately, this is fo focused so far on large scale monitoring. So utility scale, some commercial, where there's a really big investment going on and of course, they, re ne they need a very reliable monitoring system to enable them to ensure that they get the return on that investment. But residents in the home, they're spending, of course, slightly less on their, on their uh, solar systems. They don't have the extra capital to afford a massive, unique, tailor-made monitoring system for their house. So what we see is a bit of a gap in the market. If we look here, across the residential, commercial and utility sectors, we can see that there are monitoring products that will show you production data in each of those. But performance analysis is generally limited to the utility scale. And of course, if you don't have performance analysis, it's even more difficult to do fault diagnosis. And what's interesting about that is for the customer, that's where the greatest value lies actually being able to understand why the faults occurring and how to deal with them. So we see a bit of a gap down here in the residential and commercial market for what's really important for customers. And so that's where solar analytics is trying to fill that gap. So now we're focusing mostly on residential and commercial and doing all of these things to provide all that value. And so we're already doing it. You can see here, this is our monitoring hardware, smart monitor. And so from this, we're connecting the inverter and the PV panels via the meter board, which goes through to the grid. And then we're sending that data back to our server so that we can analyze the energy. The user can see this on the usual suspects in terms of devices. And we can see a nice plain information, the user can see how the system is performing, if there are any faults, what faults have occurred and what they need to do about them. And more importantly, we can send that information to the system installer or retailer so that they are already armed with the data and they're not getting surprised by customers who are a bit unhappy that their electricity bills have started to increase again. They can be proactive and go out there and, f and solve these faults as soon as they occur, which means happy lazy dogs. Not quite sure why that slide's in there, but I'll blame Stefan for that one. <laughs> okay, we're trying to provide useful information here. So we can see here things like the consumption. So not just the solar production, but also the household consumption. What, are you, what is your household load consuming? Over what time of the day? Where are your peaks? We can see the performance over the, over, over the day or over the month compared to the expected generation. So not just what you're producing, but what we've calculated that you should be producing based on your specific system configuration and your local weather. And then we can show you what your savings were. So generally, so you can see how much money you're, you're making from your system, or you can see how much you might be foregoing if you have a fault. We can show status, statuses, faults, and then as I, as I explained, we can see what to do about them. So for example, if we detect a string fault, we'll tell you about it and we'll tell your installer about it. We can provide even more detailed information directly to the installers themselves. 
So for solar energy, it's not just about the amount of energy or the amount of power you're producing. There are other important factors. The reactive power, the power factor, the actual specifics of the current and voltage, these are all very important in terms of diagnosing what a fault might be or trying just to understand um, what kind of energy you're producing. And this is already happening, being dist distributed through uh, various resellers throughout the country. So typically, the system retailer will sell solar analytics monitoring with their solar system so that they can see the benefit of this product and providing an edge, a differentiation in the market um, so they can see that their brand is really serious about quality over the long haul. At the moment, we're up to about 500 sites that are um, monitored by us with expectations of growing quite rapidly in the next few years. So we should be going through several thousand sites um, in the next coming, uh, coming year. So it'll be pretty exciting times for us. Um, so who are we? And I, I think this is important because I think this is what sets us apart from a few other monitoring companies, is that we really have a, a PV focus. Um, we're PV experts and that's where our history is and that's um, what we're bringing to the table here. So Stefan Jarnison, co-founder and our managing director with over 20 years experience. You might remember him from Pacific Solar, CSG Solar, SunTech R&D, SunTech Power. Um, Volantis, also a co-founder um, and UNSW graduate. Renata Regan, very happy to see you here today. Thanks, Renata. Co-founder and commercial director. Dr. John Laird is our software development manager. So he's the one who actually puts everything into the code and actually uh, works on all the algorithms. And I'm lucky enough to, uh, to add myself to that list and work with all these wonderful people. And as I want to point out, we have a really good connection with UNSW. So we see here four out of those five are UNSW graduates. Um, we do let Stefan know about that on a regular basis. Um, but he's had quite an association with UNSW through various projects and various um, companies over time. Um, what I would also note is that we have a quite an academic focus. Okay, we have PhDs throughout the, throughout the organisation. We come from a research background and we're interested in research projects. And so we're really keen to work even more with UNSW as we have in the past to, uh, to even further improve our analytics capabilities. We have an additional 10 people in the company, software developers, designers, sales, service, operations and analysis. And we support the co-op scholarship program. So we're bringing through that next generation of the best from the PV degree and renewable energy degree here at UNSW. Um, a little bit about where we came from. So solar analytics began as a, as a joint exercise between Suntec R&D Australia and Volantis Bay himself with uh, Envo Solar. Um, out of that was born solar analytics um, a couple of years ago now and went through quite a lot of development work to get the, pro the product um, up and running. We were assisted by a project um, here with, with uh, UNSW here at the Centre for Low Carbon Living, um, where people such as uh, Jesse Copper um, had a huge influence on actually getting the algorithms, um, the first run algorithms for uh, the products that we're providing. Um, more recently, um, with the wind up of SunTech R&D Australia, we've come in with new investors and now we're backed by AGL specifically the AGL New Energy Division, which is all about solar and, and renewable energy. Um, and so we have uh, quite an optimistic future with them. And out of that is also born the rebranding and, uh, and the new phase in solar analytics. All right, that must mean we're about a third of the way through. So it's a, it's a family affair as well. Okay, so the next stage is the faults and case studies. So I'm going to, going to take you through a few of the typical faults we might see and give you an idea about what they look like and how we detect them. So you can see here breakdown of system faults. Um, and it turns out that the majority here are in the inverter. Um, and just to get an idea, I remember when I went through, uh, through the undergraduate course and even my PhD, we were very PV focused. Can I see a show of hands? Who here in the room works actively on, on PV research or, or, or PV modules? Don't be shy. All right, quite a few. Who works specifically on inverters? 
right, you need more friends. <laughs> because we can see here, and that kind of, it's, it's a bit mean to equate them one to one because inverters have probably a lot more um, aspects to them, a lot more things that can fail. But we see, specifically here at UNSW, a big focus on PV research, and you're all doing a pretty damn good job because the PV failures are pretty small. They're in here, they're in, here in this region that's uh, not really large enough to actually get a percentage on it. But the inverters, there's a lot more work to do in terms of reliability. They're very, very complex creatures. Um, I don't understand them myself. Um, but yeah, 51% of failures is due to the inverters, so we, we really need to um, do some more work there. And for us, it means we need to be on the lookout at Solar Analytics for understanding how to detect an inverter failure and what it looks like. We see through the data about 26% of systems underperforming and about 12% annual fault rate. So it is a significant number. Um, it's not going to happen to every system, but you don't want it to be yours that it happens to. What we see here, if we, uh, we look at the data from um, SunWiz a couple of years ago, is that around half of the systems analyzed were performing within expectations, uh, but we had a few, a small amount lower than expected, and then about a quarter that were quite significantly lower than expected. So we're about trying to get that energy back for our customers. And so here's a list of typical kind of faults we see, earth leakage, soiling, isolators, often it's just a circuit breaker that's off, wiring connections, intermittent problems, they're the, the hardest kind, uh, and then some panel problem, problems, micro cracks, hot spots, potential induced degradation. So let me take you through a case study now of a couple of the faults, or one of the faults that we see to begin with. This is taken from a 10 kilowatt system in Tasmania that has two subarrays to it. So we have a large subarray that's pointing northwest and a smaller one that's pointing southwest. So it's not entirely easy, but what we can see here is when we look at the, in the yellow, the produced energy, and in the gray, the expected energy, around here, it drops down and the produced is a lot smaller than the expected for most of those days around that period with a bit of variation. And what we are able to see is that if you look at the high resolution data, this is what that system should be producing on a reasonably good day. And then at around this point, this is what it began to produce in the yellow here. And what we were able to detect is that that missing energy, which is represented by the blue bit here, was equal to the amount that was provided by the smaller of the two arrays. And so because we were able to detect and estimate what each array should be producing at what time of day, we can, we can see here whether it fits that pattern. And even we can see on this side a little bit of intermittency. This was a difficult problem to find because it kept coming and going. Um, but once it was solved, it meant that the customer was there getting back about 20 to 30 percent of their energy that they were losing over that period. Um, second case study, I'm going to look at uh, another system up in Queensland here, which has two inverters on it. Now this is what we might normally see if we just take the simple approach. And that, that's the daily energy output of the two inverters. Now, if I tell you that inverter one is a five kilowatt um, inverter with five kilowatt array, roughly, and inverter two is a, a four kilowatt inverter, then we might look at that and say, well, roughly looks okay. Nothing to see here. But if we do the calculations, which our system does automatically, we can see that inverter one is performing more or less in line with its expectations. Whereas inverter two is quite a lot lower. And so we need to find out what's causing that difference. Now we can go here and have a look at the hourly energy data, or the hourly power, power data in this case. And what we can see here for a good day, and this is a relatively sunny day, inverter one is doing more or less what you would expect. And inverter two is dropping down around here. Any guesses at this stage as to what might be causing that? Partial shading. Partial shading? Yeah, that's a pretty good guess. 
What if I told you that it looks different on every day? I had the same question. I looked at it, partial shading, easy. And I was wondering why my shading calculator wasn't detecting it. And then I was trying to find out well, what's wrong with my shading calculator. And eventually, I looked at the high resolution, well, I looked at this pretty quickly. I looked at the high resolution data and found this. Now still possibly partial shading, okay? Still not convinced. But then, if we look at the five second data, we see this. And this starts to look pretty regular here. And as it turns out, what was happening is that the inverter is turning off for about 90 seconds in periods and then coming back on in spikes. Now looking at this, can anyone guess what's causing this to happen? I'll give you a clue. Look at the things that are plotted on this graph. Over voltage, yeah. So you can see here this voltage is getting up to about 262 volts. And as soon as it does that, the inverter says, no, nope, got to turn off. Because the inverters they include a setting for over voltage. The over voltage is specified by the network as to what voltage they're allowed to operate at. Of course, they make it really easy for us by every network having different specifications. And then they make it even worse because every inverter is programmed differently. And not even all inverters are actually programmed as they're supposed to be. Even in this case, you can see one of the inverters did have that setting and one of the inverters didn't. So we can see here that it's not always just as easy as setting the, uh, the conditions and then, and then hoping for the best. We actually have to look at what's happening and adjust the expectations around those. This is becoming a, an ever increasing problem as, as many of you might um, know already that especially in regions where there's a high PV penetration, the voltage of the grid is being pushed up by all the extra power that's being dumped onto there. And it's a problem at the moment that's being sort of shifted around because the networks are saying, well, it's not our fault. And they're just saying, well, you've got to turn off the inverter. Whereas we've actually got to find a better way of A, for setting the voltage um, tap so that they can expect this kind of behavior, but B, making sure we have better use of the energy in terms of matching demand and supply. So I'm going to move on to another case study and we've already alluded to, do it, to it. So if I look at this and we can see the measured energy in the purple here and the expected energy in the orange here and these are four single days across four different months at hourly resolution. Now. Anyone guess what's causing this? This drop off here compared to what's expected? Shading seems every time it looks like it's shading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're all nervous to say shading now because it wasn't last time. We but have four now compared to. <laughs> four now, exactly. So that's exactly right. So once you start to see the pattern occurring, then you can be pretty sure. Um, and in fact, that's how we detect. So we look at the patterns across the data and we, when we isolate what occurs frequently over a, over a certain period of time because of course we have to remember that shading changes throughout the year. We can't just set it once and then forget it. So we look at a constantly rolling period and assess what's happened over that period and then look for those fingerprints and then we can find okay well this is what this system is actually producing compared to the ideal scenario and all the rest we can put down to shading. So what we can do then is adjust our expectations because it's no point just giving the customer the information that your system is performing at 80% because if that 80% is, if that 20% loss is shading, there's not necessarily something they can do about it if it's the building next door. So what we want to be able to do is still provide that customer the, the information that their system is performing as it should be. And that's why we can adjust those expectations by taking to, into account the shading, projecting that on every day not just the perfect days, um, and accounting for how much of the irradiance is direct, how much is diffuse, and accordingly discounting those aspects um, due to the shading. And what we could see with that side is before we, I, I'm not sure if you can see it very clearly here, but before we enabled the shading calculator on this side, 
it was regularly underperforming with the yellow here being lower than the grey. And once we take into account of the shading, now it's actually performing fairly close to expectations. All right, that must mean we're two thirds of the way through. So the last section, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research projects that we are either working on or looking to work on in the near future. So to start with, the first one is load disaggregation. Now, what's important about understanding your, your household load is that, as I mentioned, you want to match it as well as you can with the solar. But you can't just shift your entire load one way or the other, or increase or decrease it. But you can shift individual appliances. But how do you know what the individual appliances are actually using? unless you go and put a monitor on every single one, which some of us in the room are nerdy enough to do, but not the average person out there in the community. So what we can do is look at the data itself, and then we can identify fingerprints within the data that tell us when something switches on, when something switches off. By looking at uh, various aspects, we can see well, what might that appliance be, and over time, the system can learn, so it can, then, it can then determine how much of the energy is due to, say, the fridge or the air conditioning or the stove or the heater or anything else. So this is something that we're working on with Lachlan McDermott, an honours thesis student here at UNSW, who's been doing a pretty, uh, pretty good job of that, and that's something we hope to improve on in the future. The next one I'll quickly talk about is PV generation forecasting. So at the moment we can tell you what your system produced today and what we expect that it should produce today. And so we can tell you the performance of today. But you might be interested in what's happening tomorrow. Because if you want to actually determine whether to say charge your battery or discharge your battery or shift a load back and forward, then you really need to know that forecast of how much energy you're going to uh, create tomorrow. And now I'm not suggesting that the average person is nerdy enough like me, what we might be, to actually sit at home and then, and then program in when their washing machine should turn on or off or anything like that. But once you integrate that with smart home energy management, a lot of that can happen automatically. But none of that can happen as effectively without PV generation forecasting. So we have two more thesis students. Jonathan Lee and Rachel O, who are working on that throughout this year. And for example, they've been looking at simulation software and forecasting software and comparing that, at least in the past, um, so doing some hindcasting methods to see how well that can forecast and predict what the solar generation is going to be. So we're looking forward to more results on that. Um, we have just begun a new collaboration with the Centre for Low Carbon Living, um, which will extend this PV generation forecasting work with a, a new P, uh, PhD student, Bibek. And in addition to that, we need to forecast the household consumption because, of course, it's one thing just to have the PV generation, but if you don't know how much energy the household is going to consume, then you can't get the full value out of that information. So Baran is going to be working on that over the next few years. And that's a pretty exciting project to, uh, to really get the most out of, out, of this, out of what's happening for the energy management. On top of that, we have another project proposal that's being reviewed at the moment. And this would be a project between hardware company Wattwatches, who we already, already partner with, and AGL and of course UNSW again. And so that will encompass hardware development and home energy management, battery monitoring and optimization. And so the idea here is to take the inputs that we can hopefully create with the PV and home energy demand forecasting work and then actually use that to get a positive outcome for the household. So we can develop the hardware to, to turn on and off appliances, we can develop the hardware to better me measure what we need to measure at lower cost. We can develop the systems for home energy management 
to actually determine what's the best way to shift loads. Um, and of course, the battery monitoring and optimization. Um, unless you've been sleeping under a rock, then you will have seen that the battery uh, storage revolution is coming. And over the next few years, battery prices are going to come down in the same way that PV prices did over the last sort of five to 10 years. And so we'll be seeing a, uh, a big change in the way that energy is used in the household. And so all of us in the industry really have to be ready for that. And so of course, then there's future projects. So just recently, the next round of ARC linkage projects was, was launched. And so we're considering putting in an application for that if we find the right partner. So anyone who's interested, let us know. And so a couple of the options that we might be looking at are, for example, solar hot water. Can we, can we estimate the energy that a solar hot water system should be producing and see if those systems are actually doing what they, what they, what they should? I think about this every time I walk home and I go past a solar hot water system in my neighbourhood that is entirely under a tree and entirely covered with dirt. <laughs> I suspect they're not getting much out of it. Uh, how can we improve our algorithms? So how can we get more out of machine learning techniques? Um, as we get more and more data, as I said, we're about 500 systems at the moment, but when we get to the stage where we're talking tens of thousands of systems, then we'll have one of the most sophisticated data sets um, in the country. Um, and what we can learn out of that, not just for our own predictions and fault diagnosis, but in terms of what's useful um, to network operators, to retailers. Um, there's a lot of opportunity there. And that leads us into grid management. So with the recent release of the new specifications for inverters, we're starting to see more requirements on actually having PV systems help the grid rather than, rather than hinder it, I guess, which is what's being suggested at the moment. And though, so in terms of power factor correction and, and, and such issues, there's a lot of opportunity there for PV systems, but it needs a lot of research in terms of what's the best way to do this. How is it done automatically? So those are a, a few of the things that we're, we're interested in. And of course, there'll be many, many more. Um, and of course, we're really keen to keep that relationship with UNSW going because obviously you're all here because it's the best place for solar energy research. And uh, we really want to keep involved. So to finish, again, I remind you of why we're here and uh, what our purpose is. It's to maximise the value customers receive from their solar energy system. And so I hope that I've given you a, a small insight into how we do that and why we do that. Um, and I hope that uh, anyone who's working in these areas are uh, keen to let us know and, uh, and collaborate. Because again, we're really keen on that research focus. That's what we love doing most. Um, and so with that, I'll thank you for your time and I think we've got plenty of time left for questions. So let's go to it. Thanks for a great presentation. Just curious, you said there's about 500 systems at the moment being monitored. Uh, are those retrofitted uh, existing systems that have had the products go on, or are they um, new builds as in it came as part of a package of installing the system? Yeah, thanks. Good question. So, uh, so yeah, are our systems retrofit, or are they being installed with the system? The answer is both. So to begin with, most of them will retrofit. Um, of course, as we, as we entered the market and started uh, developing this product. But what we're seeing now is um, many, many systems go on directly with the system. So for example, many of um, the resellers, they put their little, little logos up before, have decided to put on our uh, monitoring system with all of their um, new installations, AGL for example. And so yeah, those are going in straight away. It's, um, it creates a slightly different um, uh, situation I guess because on the one hand you might have a system that's that's been operating for quite a while and might already have existing um, issues with it and it might already have some aging which we, we take into account um, compared to the new systems where we can go in and then we can identify things straight away that might have been done it's a lot easier then to actually get the installer um, back to fix anything that might uh, might be wrong because it's a bit more fresh in the memory 
Um, does the customer pay separately for the device itself and ongoing data analysis? Like, you know, you're looking into specific cases that you can't figure out. Yeah, so, so yeah, that's a um, good question on, on what the payment structure is. So basically, at the moment, there's, it's a subscription service. Um, but the subscription includes the hardware, so there's a, a minimum five-year subscription at the moment. So basically that covers the hardware cost and then ongoing, and if they, um, we hope they continue that subscription after five years, then they can continue to get that service. And that doesn't matter how many times a fault occurs or how many alerts they get or how many notifications they get. Um, you know, every system is what it is. Um, so if you have a poorly performing system, um, then I guess you definitely get your money's worth. And is it more expensive with more inverters? Um, oh, I'd have to ask Stefan. <laughs> it is, I'd have to ask Renata. Yeah. It is more expensive with more inverters. It's a, uh, yeah, it's a per inverter charge. How much is it? Um, it's the, the recommended retail price <laughs> for uh, the five-year subscription is 600 plus GST? Yeah, 600 plus GST, 660 in total. Okay. Um, for a single device, I brought a device with me. A little device is about the size of a phone that goes in the meter box. Um, yes, and it's, yeah, it's the, there are different ways, we've looked at different ways yeah. to structure the business but model. It's also with one device it's possible to measure more than one inverter in some cases and then with that one device we measure the um, solar production and the household consumption. Um, and you could also measure sub-circuits as well. So um, Stefan's just bought a storage heater and we're measuring the um, consumption on his, uh, on his storage heater. So in the future we'll be looking at having devices with uh, more inputs as well so we could directly measure um, some more of the major circuits around the house and that will greatly assist with the load disaggregation. It means that we don't have to do everything from the data, just some of it. But yeah, so there's a few things we can do with that one, one device, but yeah, $660 for a five year subscription. We might be able to do you a special deal though, Emily. <laughs> um, I have two questions actually. So um, same thing with the inverter, I think that's a really uh, brand new information to me. I noticed that uh, the failure rate is so high. So I, I wonder for your service, how fast can you provide an actual solution to the customer instead of just this is the data and then we need time to process them to read them and give you the reason and then we can let the contractor to come and fix it or everything and then probably you can give an example like if uh, um, the system detects its uh, input fa mm -hmm. failure and how fast the customer can get his or her um, all system back online to produce the full capacity that's question one question two is um, I have limited understanding of poly inverter as well, but basically I, I see just uh, convert a DC to AC for your um, application um, directly used from the power generated by the solar panel. Um, have you considered or encountered any uh, situation people that using energy storage system other than the battery? Because if we have a system that only consume AC from a storage system rather than directly from the panel. So that maybe can ease the capacity for the inverter to do the work like convert it back mm -hmm. and forth. Um, like cause for, for my background, I'm doing hydrogen storage. It's, it's another mm -hmm. alternative okay. to uh, uh, battery. So I think um, what are the major failure reason for, for the customer you've uh, involved? And uh, how would you, what, what's your view on the feasibility of other sort of option of uh, any storage and battery. Okay, yeah, in interesting questions. Um, I'll try to go through that. If I, if I don't get to all of that, remind me. Um, but to, to begin with, uh, the question about how we go from alerting customers to actually solving um, the issues. So the important thing to remember is that the solving the issue is still the responsibility of the company that sold the system, so the retailer. And so what we do is give the information as quickly as we can to the retailer. Now that will depend on what kind of fault it is. Um, some faults that um, aren't quite so obvious, that are a bit, uh, a bit more difficult to detect, might take some time. And certainly at the moment, um, we are still developing some of the algorithms to detect uh, some specific faults. So some things even still require manual intervention from me and my team. On the other hand, we have some things that are detected immediately. 
So I'll give you an example. Uh, on July 11th, the new regulations came in uh, around safety for possible earth faults. Now, an earth leakage fault, uh, for those who don't know, means that you get a current path from the system down through the ground. So there's likely due to some sort of poor insulation of the, uh, the wiring or so on. Um, particularly happens when there's lots of moisture around, so rain or, or in winter when there's a lot of condensation on the panels. And that can, under some circumstances, present a safety hazard if someone's up there touching the system. Now, what that new regulation required was that the inverter detect that problem and alert the system owner um, at least every hour with some sort of alarm or something, which means that everyone has to go in and retrofit, put in some sort of dongle and add a little alarm if they didn't already have it um, to do that. And it has to be, depending on where it's located, if it's not an obvious place, it needs to be a loud alarm or just a flashing light or something. But what we've been given um, uh, permission to do is to address that regulation with email alerts. So it is sufficient from the clean energy regulator for us to detect that the inverter has switched off and to send an email every hour to the owner and to the system retailer and alert them that's happening. So in that, in that case, the inverter goes off, potentially due to, due to an earth fault, and both the owner and the retailer get alerted, say, within, within two hours of that occurring, anywhere between one and two hours. And so then, from that point, um, we give them information of what's happened and what it might possibly be, a list of possible things to check um, to diagnose the fault further. Um, and from then, it's simply a matter of how quickly the installer can get out to the customer to do it. That's then in sort of a their ballpark. And we will continue to remind them if they haven't solved it after a few days. So we, we try to look out for our, um, our customers by keep on nudging the, uh, the retailers to solve the problem. So the communication is based on email. So basically the whole module need to connect you online. Yeah. That's right, everything's online, yeah. yeah. So from the customer point of view, do they ha need to have this um, data reading duty to solve the problem? Because I saw you analyze No, no the, cu the customer doesn't need to do anything. All, all, I mean, the customer can look at the data if they want, if they're interested, but ideally the customer doesn't have to do anything. They, they if they want, they don't have to go onto the portal or, or do anything at all. They will be alerted if there's a problem. And even then, they don't necessarily have to read the alerts um, because the retailer will be alerted as well and should call them and say, hey, you've got a problem, I'll come and fix it for you. So the interface you just showed us, like on your tablet, on your laptop, that's actually for your staff, it's not for customers? It is for the customers, okay. it is for the customers, but the alerts will come separately. So the alerts will be shown both on that interface, but also by email. Okay, so what kind of information are those interfaces provide to the customer besides the usage expectation and actual? Yeah, so they'll show a bit of the fault history. Um, they'll, they'll show, uh, apart from that, the usage, they'll show a breakdown depending on what sort of circuits are being measured. Um, breakdown of, of the whole consumption or partial consumption, pool pump, whatever, if they're measuring those specifically. Um, and that will also um, allow us to add some of the coming features. So that will be able to show them um, what their system is likely, likely to, to produce tomorrow or the day after. Uh, it will show them a few you know, pointers and advice on how to save energy. Um, a lot of features that we spoke about in the, in the projects will be added through that portal to try and help, help them out. Um, on to your second question about the types of storage. So at the moment, um, we're, we're basically still looking at how we can interact with storage of any type. So, there are only a few systems out there at the moment that don't have battery storage. Essentially, it, we use current transformers to measure, the, um, me measure the, the current flow and calculate the energy that way. So anything that we can get a CT around, we can measure. Um, now, some batteries represent a bit of a challenge because they're integrated with an inverter, which means that you can't actually access it where you want. Um, we're looking at trying to get the data directly out of the battery itself. So by plugging in or via uh, an API if the battery has one. So there's a lot of options of how we get the data out of that system and then turn it through our analytics to display it. So yeah, it would depend on the battery type. Obviously we're going to focus on the most prevalent technologies. Um, so I 
I hope that your, your technology is successful and it comes out there and reduces the cost of batteries even further. Um, and if that's out there on thousands of systems, then you can bet we'll be, one, we'll be monitoring it. Because I think it would be a good advantage for that is we probably can skip this uh, DC to AC version. We put the primary energy source for all the, all the um, appliance at home all from that particular source, which is a storage. So nothing directly from the panel to the <coughs> application. It could be a thing to do. If efficiency is high enough, it sounds great. Thank you, Alison. Um, how much how much historical data do you do you store, and um, do you or are you thinking about um, making available that data to manufacturers for data mining? Ah, good question. Um, okay, so how much data do we store? We store all the data that we begin measuring. So as soon as we install the um, uh, the system on your on your house, the monitoring system, then all that data will remain in the database. In fact, you'll be able to see it as the customer. Um, and are we going to provide that to others? Uh, yeah, it depends. Um, obviously, we can't and we, we wouldn't want to provide any um, user-specific data, but uh, data on mass, anonymized, um, is going to be really interesting. Um, and so, in terms of to your your thinking in terms of manufacturers, PV manufacturers. So if you're an inverter manufacturer, for example, yeah, right. and you wanted to mine, you wanted to get a whole lot of statistics about all the yeah. inverters out there. This would be a godsend. Yeah, absolutely, and that's what we're hoping we'll be able to have when, once we've got, like, say, tens of thousands of systems rather than 500, and we have some sort of, I guess, significant data set, and we can see, okay, what aspects of inverters are failing the most, what brands are failing the most. Um, um, yeah, that data will be really useful. So I guess we're still understanding the opportunities of, of where the data is, is valuable and to whom, um, but all those options will be presenting themselves in the coming years, I guess. I guess a lot of those manufacturers would be willing to pay for that data. Let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, how much money I can save if I use your service? So at the moment we have a guarantee. We're, we're delving into the marketing um, part that is obviously not my favourite um, thing to talk about. But I do understand we have a money back guarantee. So if it doesn't save you money, then you don't pay anything for the system. Um, how much money can you save? I think uh, the number Stefan quoted the other day was 17%. So that's, that's the expected energy lost over, over five years from a walking So in terms of how much, yeah, how much you'll save, then it depends on the size of your system, obviously. So if you have a system that's um, you know, five kilowatts um, and so producing what uh, 2,000 or 2,000 kilowatt hours a year thereabouts um, uh, then then yeah so it'll depend on on the size of your system and that amount of potential loss as to how much it could save you but of course every every system is going to be different so it must be more than what you've chucked right yeah that's right so but every system will be different so some systems will perform perfectly for 20 years and have no faults whatsoever um, and other systems will be catastrophic and fail every couple of years. Um, it won't be the majority that fail every couple of years, and we hope. Um, but same question: How much you save on insurance? Exactly. So it's a, it, it is a bit. Work with the insurance company, and the sort of average to average is out. Yeah. So, so it is a bit of insurance to make sure it's not going to be you. That's why we've aimed for something that's low enough cost, because we don't want. As I said at the beginning, you, ca you can't afford with a household system to have a, a large, complicated, unique, tailored system. It has to be low cost and fairly simple, and so that over the life of the system is going to be a worthwhile investment. The little bit of hardware is about $300, so the, solar, the actual subscription part is only $300, and we're actually trying to drive down the price of the hardware. Um, and then the other the really big market for this technology is in the solar leasing programs where at the moment most residents, mostly it's the how, how the homeowner who bears the risk. Within the leasing programs, it's a financier who's bearing the risk and they want to know that the system is performing. There's plenty of systems that will go offline for three months. You don't know until your bill comes in. Sometimes it's, you know, you look at your bill and you go, that's a little odd, and you wait another three months <laughs> before the next bill comes in. So there's, and, and the leasing companies don't want to do that at all. So if that list that you saw of our resellers a number of those are finances offering a leasing product. We will need to finish because there is class after us. So let's thank Jono again. Thank you.